A Visit to Newgate by Charles Dickens The force of habit is a trite phrase in everybody's mouth, and it is not a little remarkable that those who use it most as applied to others unconsciously afford in their own persons singular examples of the power which habit and custom exercise over the minds of men, and of the little reflection they are apt to bestow on subjects with which every day's experience has rendered them familiar. If Bedlam could be suddenly removed like another Aladdin's palace, and set down on the space now occupied by Newgate, scarcely one man out of a hundred, whose road to business every morning lies through Newgate Street or the Old Bailey, would pass the building without bestowing a hasty glance on its small grated windows, and a transient thought upon the condition of the unhappy beings immured in the dismal cells. And yet these same men, day by day, and hour by hour, pass and repass this gloomy depository of the guilty and misery of London, in one perpetual stream of life and bustle, utterly unmindful of the throng of wretched creatures pent up within it, nay, not even knowing, or if they do, not heeding the fact, that as they pass one particular angle of the massive wall, with a light laugh or a merry whistle, they stand within one yard of a fellow creature, bound and helpless, whose hours are numbered, from whom the last feeble ray of hope has fled for ever, and whose miserable career will shortly terminate in a violent and shameful death. Contact with death, even in its least terrible shape, is solemn and appalling. How much more awful is it to reflect on this near vicinity to the dying, to men in full health and vigor, in the flower of youth or the prime of life, with all their facilities and perceptions as acute and perfect as your own, but dying none the less, dying as surely with the hand of death imprinted upon them as indelibly as if mortal disease had wasted their frames to shadows and corruption had already begun. It is with some such thought as these that we determined, not many weeks since, to visit the interior of Newgate, in an amateur capacity, of course, and having carried our intentions into effect, we proceed to lay its results before our readers in the hope founded more upon the nature of the subject than on any presumptuous confidence in our own descriptive powers. That this paper may not be found wholly devoid of interest, we have only to presume that we do not intend to fatigue the reader with any statistical accounts of the prison. They will be found at length in numerous reports of numerous committees, and a variety of authorities of equal weight. We took no note, made no memoranda, measured none of the yards, ascertained the exact number of inches in no particular room, were unable even to report of how many apartments the jail is composed. We saw the prison and saw the prisoners, and what we did see, and what we thought, we will tell at once in our own way. Having delivered our credentials to the servant who answered our knock at the door of the governor's house, we were ushered into the office, a little room on the right side as you enter, with two windows looking into the old bailey, fitted up like an ordinary attorney's office or merchant's counting-house, with the usual fixtures, a waistcoated partition, a shelf or two, a desk, a couple of stools, a pair of clerks, an almanac, a clock, and a few maps. After a little delay, occasioned by sending into the interior of the prison for the officer whose duty it was to conduct us, that functionary arrived, a respectable-looking man of about two or three and fifty, in a broad-brimmed hat and full suit of black, who, but for his keys, would have looked quite as much like a clergyman as a turnkey. We were disappointed he had not even top-boots on. Following our conductor by a door opposite to that at which we had entered, we arrived at a small room, without any other furniture than a little desk, and a book for visitors' autographs, and a shelf on which were a few boxes for papers and casts of the heads and faces of the two notorious murderers, Bishop and Williams, 
the former, in particular, exhibiting a style of head and set of features which might have affronted sufficient moral grounds for his instant execution at any time, even had there been no other evidence against him. Leaving this room also by an opposite door, we found ourselves at the lodge which opens on the old bailey, one side of which is plentifully garnished with a choice collection of heavy sets of irons, including those worn by the redoubtable Jack Shepherd, a genuine, and those said to have been graced by the sturdy limbs of the no less celebrated Dick Turpin, doubtful. From this lodge a heavy oaken gate, bound with iron, studded with nails of the same material, and guarded by another turnkey, opens on a few steps, if we remember right, which terminate in a narrow and dismal stone passage, running parallel with the old bailey, and leading to the different yards through a number of tortuous and intricate windings, guarded in their turn by huge gates and gratings, whose appearance is sufficient to dispel at once the slight hope of escape that any newcomer may have entertained, and the very recollections of which, on eventually traversing the place again, involves one in a maze of confusion. It is necessary to explain here that the buildings in the prison, or in other words the different wards, form a square, of which the four sides abut respectively on the Old Bailey, the Old College of Physicians, now forming a part of Newgate Market, the Sessions House, and Newgate Street. The intermediate space is divided into several paved yards, in which the prisoners take such air and exercise as can be had in such a place. These yards, with the exception of that in which the prisoners under sentence of death are confined, of which we shall presently give a more detailed description, run parallel with Newgate Street, and consequently from the Old Bailey, as it were, to Newgate Market. The women's side is in the right wing of the prison nearest the Sessions House. As we were introduced into this part of the building first, we will adopt the same order and introduce our readers to it also. Turning to the right, then, down the passage to which we now averted, omitting any mention of intervening gates, for if we noticed every gate that was unlocked for us to pass through, and locked again as soon as we had passed, we should require a gate at every comma. We came to a door, composed of thick bars of wood, through which were discernible, passing to and fro, a narrow yard, some twenty women, the majority of whom, however, as soon as they were aware of the presence of strangers, retreated into their wards. One side of this yard is railed off at a considerable distance, and formed into a kind of iron cage, about five feet ten inches in height, roofed at the top, and defended in front by iron bars, from which the friends of the female prisoners communicate with them. In one corner of the singular-looking den was a yellow, haggard, decrepit old woman, in a tattered gown that had once been black, and the remains of an old straw bonnet, with faded ribbon of the same hue, in earnest conversation with a young girl, a prisoner, of course, of about two and twenty. It is impossible to imagine a more poverty-stricken object, or a creature so borne down in soul and body, by excess of misery and destitution, as the old woman. The girl was a good-looking, robust female, with a profusion of hair streaming about in the wind, for she had no bonnet on, and a man's silk-pocket handkerchief loosely thrown over a most ample pair of shoulders. The old woman was talking in that low, stifled tone of voice, which tells so forcibly of mental anguish, and every now and then burst into an irrepressible, sharp, abrupt cry of grief, the most distressing sound that ears can hear. The girl was perfectly unmoved, hardened beyond all hope of redemption, she listened doggedly to her mother's entreaties, whatever they were, and beyond inquiring after Jem, and eagerly catching at the few half-pennies her miserable parent had brought her, took no more apparent interest in the conversation than the most unconcerned spectators. Heaven knows there were enough of them, in the persons of the other prisoners in the yard, who were no more concerned by what was passing before their eyes, and within their hearing, than if they were blind and deaf. Why should they be? Inside the prison and out, such scenes were too familiar to them. 
to excite even a passing thought, unless of ridicule or contempt for feelings which they had long since forgotten. A little further on, a squalid-looking woman, in a slovenly thick-bordered cap, with her arms muffled in a large red shawl, the fringed ends of which straggled nearby to the bottom of a dirty white apron, was communicating some instructions to her visitor, her daughter evidently. The girl was thinly clad and shaking with the cold. Some ordinary word of recognition passed between her and her mother when she appeared at the grating, but neither hope, condolence, regret, nor affection was expressed on either side. The mother whispered her instructions, and the girl received them with her pinched-up, half-starved features twisted into an expression of careful cunning. It was some scheme for the woman's defense that she was disclosing. Perhaps a sullen smile came over the girl's face for an instant, as if she were pleased, not so much at the probability of her mother's liberation, as at the chance of her getting off in spite of her prosecutions. The dialogue was soon concluded, and with the same careless indifference with which they had approached each other, the mother turned towards the inner end of the yard and the girl to the gate at which she had entered. The girl belonged to a class, unhappily, but too extensive, the very existence of which should make men's hearts bleed. Barely past her childhood, it required but a glance to discover that she was one of those children, born and bred in neglect and vice, who have never known what childhood is, who have never been taught to love and court a parent's smile, or to dread a parent's frown. The thousand nameless endearments of childhood, its gaiety and its innocence, are alike unknown to them. They have entered at once upon the stern realities and miseries of life, and to their better nature it is almost hopeless to appeal in after times by any of the references which will awaken, if it only be for a moment, some good feeling in ordinary bosoms, however corrupt they may have become. Talk to them of parental solicitude, the happy days of childhood, and the merry games of infancy. Tell them hunger and the streets, beggary and stripes, the gin shop, the station house, and the pawnbrokers, and they will understand you. Two or three women were standing in different parts of the grating, conversing with their friends, but a very large proportion of the prisoners appeared to have no friends at all, beyond such as their old companions as might happen to be within the walls. So, passing hastily down the yard, and pausing only for an instant to notice the little incidents we have just recorded, we were conducted up a clean and well-lighted flight of stone stairs to one of the wards. There are several in this part of the building, but a description of one is a description of the whole. It was a spacious, bare, whitewashed apartment, lighted, of course, by windows looking into the interior of the prison, but far more light and airy than one could reasonably expect to find in such a situation. There was a large fire with a deal table before it, round which ten or a dozen women were seated on wooden forms at dinner. Along both sides of the room ran a shelf. Below it, at regular intervals, a row of large hooks were fixed on the wall, on each of which was hung the sleeping mat of a prisoner, her rug and blanket being folded up and placed on the shelf above. At night, these mats were placed on the floor, each beneath the hook on which it hangs during the day. The ward is thus made to answer the purpose both of a day-room and a sleeping apartment. Over the fireplace was a large sheet of plasterboard, on which were displayed a variety of texts from Scripture, which were also scattered about the room in scraps about the size and shape of the copy slips which are used in schools. On the table was a sufficient provision of a kind of stewed beef and brown bread in pewter dishes, which are kept perfectly bright and displayed on shelves in great order and regularity when they are not in use. The women rose hastily at our entrance and retired in a hurried manner to either side of the fireplace. They were all cleanly, many of them decently attired, and there was nothing peculiar either in their appearance or demeanor. One of the two resumed the needlework, which they had probably laid aside at the commencement of their meal, 
Others gazed at the visitors with litless curiosity, and a few retired behind their companions to the very end of the room, as if desirous to avoid even the casual observation of the strangers. Some old Irish women, both in this and other wards, to whom the thing was no novelty, appeared perfectly indifferent to our presence, and remained standing close to the seats from which they had just risen. But the general feeling among the females seemed to be one of uneasiness during the period of our stay among them, which was very brief. Not a word was uttered during the time of our remaining, unless indeed by the wardswoman, in reply to some question which we put to the turnkey who accompanied us. In every ward on the female side, a wardswoman is appointed to preserve order, and a similar regulation is adopted among the males. The wardsmen and wardwomen are all prisoners selected for good conduct. They alone are allowed the privilege of sleeping on bedsteads, a small stump bedstead being placed in every ward for that purpose. On both sides of the jail is a small receiving room to which prisoners are conducted on their first reception, and whence they cannot be removed until they have been examined by the surgeon of the prison. Retracing our steps to the dismal passage in which we found ourselves at first, and which, by the by, contains three or four dark cells for the accommodation of refractory prisoners, we were led through a narrow yard to the school, a portion of the prison set apart for boys under fourteen years of age, and a tolerable-sized room in which were writing materials and some copy-books, was the schoolmaster with a couple of his pupils, the remainder having been fetched from the adjoining apartment. The whole were drawn up in line for our inspection. There were fourteen of them in all, some with shoes, some without, some in pinafores without jackets, others in jackets without pinafores, and one in scarce anything at all. The whole number, without an exception, we believe, have been committed for trial on charges of pickpocketing, and fourteen such terrible little faces we never beheld." There was not one redeeming feature among them, not a glance of honesty, not a wink expressive of anything but the gallows and the hulks in the whole collection. As to anything like shame or contrition, that was entirely out of the question. They were eventually quite gratified at being thought worth the trouble of looking at. Their idea appeared to be that we had come to see Newgate as a grand affair, and that they were an indispensable part of the show— and every boy, as he fell in to the line, actually seemed as pleased and important as if he had done something excessively meritorious in getting there at all. We never looked upon a more disagreeable sight, because we never saw fourteen such helpful creatures of neglect before. On either side of the schoolyard is a yard for men, in one of which, that towards Newgate Street, prisoners of the more respectable class are confined. Of the other we have little description to offer, as the different wards necessarily partake of the same character. They are provided, like the wards on the women's side, with mats and rugs, which are disposed of in the same manner during the day. The only very striking difference between their appearance and that of the wards inhabited by the females is the utter absence of any employment. Huddled together on two opposite forms by the fireside, sit twenty men perhaps, here a boy in livery, there a man in a rough greatcoat and top boots, farther on a desperate-looking fellow in his shirt-sleeves with an old scotch cap upon his shaggy head, near him again a tall ruffian in a smock-frock, next to him a miserable being of distressed appearance with his head resting on his hands all alike in one respect, all idle and listless. When they do leave the fire, sauntering moodily about, lounging in the window, or leaning against the wall, vacantly swinging their bodies to and fro, with the exception of the man reading an old newspaper in two or three instances, this was the case in every ward we entered. The only communication these men have with their friends is through two closed iron gratings, with an intermediate space of about a yard in width between the two, so that nothing can be handed across, nor can the prisoner have any communications by touch with the prisoner who visits him. The married men have a separate grating, 
at which to see their wives, but its construction is the same. The prison chapel is situated at the back of the governor's house, the latter having no windows looking into the interior of the prison. Whether the associations connected with this place, the knowledge that here a portion of the brutal service is, on some dreadful occasions, performed over the quick and not upon the dead, casts over it a still more gloomy and somber air than art has imparted to it. We know not, but its appearance is very striking. There is something in a silence and deserted place of worship, solemn and impressive at any time, and the very dissimilarity of this one from any we have been accustomed to only enhances the impression. The meanness of its appointments, the bare scanty pulpit with the paltry painted pillars on either side, the woman's gallery with its great heavy curtain, the men's with its unpainted benches and dingy front, a tottering little table at the altar, with the condiments on the wall above it, scarcely legible through lack of paint and dust and damp, so unlike the velvet and gilding, the marble and wood of a modern church, are strange and striking. There is one object, too, which rivets the attention and fascinates the gaze and from which we may turn horror-stricken in vain, for the recollection of it will haunt us, waking and sleeping for a long time afterward. Immediately below the reading desk, on the floor of the chapel, forming the most conspicuous object in this little area is the condemned pew, a huge black pen in which the wretched people who are singled out for death are placed on Sunday preceding their execution, in sight of all their fellow prisoners, from many of whom they may have been separated but a week before, to hear prayers for their own souls, to join in the responses of their own burial service, and to listen to an address, warning their recent companions to take example by their fate, and urging themselves, while yet there is time, nearly four and twenty hours, to turn and flee from the wrath to come. Imagine what have been the feelings of the men whom that fearful pew has enclosed, and of whom, between the gallows and the knife, no mortal remnant may now remain. Think of the hopeless clinging to life to the last, and the wild despair, far exceeding in anguish the felon's death itself, by which they have heard the certainty of their speedy transmission to another world, with all their crimes upon their heads, rung into their ears by the officiating clergyman. At one time, and at no distant period either, the coffins of the men about to be executed were placed in that pew, upon the seat by their side, during the whole service. It may seem incredible, but it is true. Let us hope that the increased spirit of civilization and humanity, which abolished this frightful and degrading custom, may extend itself to other usages equally barbarous, usages which have not even the plea of utility in their defense, as every year's experience has shown them to be more and more inefficacious. Leaving the chapel, descending to the passage so frequently alluded to, and crossing the yard before noticed, as being allotted to prisoners of a more respectable description than the general of men confined here, the visitor arrives at a thick iron gate of great size and strength. Having been admitted through it by the turnkey on duty, he turns sharp around to the left, and pauses before another gate, and having passed this last barrier, he stands in the most terrible part of this gloomy building, the condemned ward. The press yard, well known by name to newspaper readers, from its frequent mention in accounts of executions, is at the corner of the building, and next to the ordinary house, in Newgate Street, running from Newgate Street towards the center of the prison, parallel with Newgate Market. It is a long, narrow court, of which a portion of the wall in Newgate Street forms one end, and the gate at the other, at the upper end on the left hand, that is, adjoining the wall in Newgate Street, is a cistern of water, and at the bottom of a double grating, of which the gate itself forms a part, similar to that before described. Through these gates the prisoners are allowed to see their friends, a turnkey always remaining in the vacant space between. 
During the whole interview, immediately on the right as you enter, is a building containing the press room, day room, and cells. The yard is on every side surrounded by lofty walls, guarded by chavaux de frise, and the whole is under the constant inspection of vigilant and experienced turnkeys. The first apartment into which we were conducted, which was at the top of a staircase and immediately over the press room, were five and twenty or thirty prisoners, all under sentence of death, awaiting the result of the recorder's report. Men of all ages and appearances, from a hardened old offender with swarthy face and grisly beard of three days' growth, to a handsome boy not fourteen years old, and of singularly youthful appearance even for that age, who had been condemned for burglary. There was nothing remarkable in the appearance of these prisoners. One or two decently dressed men were brooding with a dejected air over the fire. Several little groups of two or three had been engaged in conversation at the upper end of the room, or in the window, and the remaining were crowded round a young man seated at a table who appeared to be engaged in teaching the younger ones to write. The room was large, airy, and clean. There was very little anxiety or mental suffering depicted in the countenance of any of the men. They had all been sentenced to death, it is true, and the recorder's report had not yet been made, but we questioned whether there was a man among them, notwithstanding, who did not know that although he had undergone the ceremony, it never was intended that his life should be sacrificed. On the table lay a testament, but there were no tokens of its having been in recent use. In the press-room below were three men, the nature of whose offence rendered it necessary to separate them, even from their companions in guilt. It is a long, sombre room, with two windows sunk into the stone wall, and here the wretched men are pinioned on the morning of their execution, before moving towards the scaffold. The fate of one of these prisoners was uncertain, some mitigatory circumstance having come to light since his trial, which had been humanely represented in the proper quarter. The other two had nothing to expect from the mercy of the crown. Their doom was sealed. No plea could be urged in extenuation of their crime, and they well knew that, for them, there was no hope in this world. The two short ones, the turnkey whispered, are dead men. The man to whom we have alluded, as entertaining some hope of escape, was lounging, at the greatest distance he could place between himself and his companions, in the window nearest the door. He was probably aware of our approach, and had assumed an air of courageous indifference. His face was purposely averted towards the window, and he stirred not an inch while we were present. The other two men were at the upper end of the room. One of them, who was imperfectly seen in the dim light, had his back toward us, and was stooping over the fire with his right arm on the mantelpiece, and his head sunk upon it. The other was leaning on the sill of the farthest window. The light fell upon him, and communicated to his pale, haggard face and disordered hair an appearance which at that distance was ghastly. His cheek rested upon his hand, and with his face a little raised, and his eyes wildly staring before him, he seemed to be unconsciously intent on counting the chinks in the opposite wall. We passed this room again afterwards. The first man was pacing up and down in the court with a firm military step. He had been a soldier in the foot guards, and a cloth cap jauntily thrown on one side of his head. He bowed respectfully to our conductor, and the salute was returned. The other two still remained at the positions we had described, and were as motionless as statues. A few paces up the yard, and forming a continuation of the building, in which are the two rooms we have just quitted, lie the condemned cells. The entrance is by a narrow and obscure staircase, leading to a dark passage in which a charcoal stove casts a lurid tint over the objects in its immediate vicinity, and diffuses something like warmth around. From the left-hand side of this passage, the massive door of every cell on the story opens, and from it alone can be approached. There are three of these passages, and three of these ranges of cells, one above the other, but in size, furniture, and appearance, 
they are all precisely alike. Prior to the recorder's report being made, all prisoners under the sentence of death are removed from the day room at five o'clock in the afternoon and locked up in these cells, where they are allowed a candle until ten o'clock, and here they remain until seven next morning. When the warrant for a prisoner's execution arrives, he is removed to the cells and confined in one of them until he leaves it for the scaffold. He is at liberty to walk in the yard, but both in his walks and in his cell, he is constantly attended by a turnkey who never leaves him on any pretense. We entered the first cell. It was a stone dungeon, eight feet long by six wide. An iron candlestick was fixed into the wall at the side, and a small high window in the back admitted as much air and light as could struggle in between a double row of heavily crossed iron bars. It contained no other furniture of any description. Conceive the situation of a man spending his last night on earth in this cell, buoyed up with some vague and undefined hope of reprieve. He knew not why, indulging in some wild and visionary idea of escape, he knew not how. Hour after hour of the three preceding days allowed him for preparation, was fled with a speed which no man living could deem possible. For none but this dying man can know. He has wearied his friends with entreaties, exhausted the attendants with importunities, neglected in his feverish restlessness a timely warning of his spiritual counsellor. And now that the illusion is at last dispelled, now that eternity is before him and guilt behind, now that his fears of death amount almost to madness, and an overwhelming sense of his helpless, hopeless state rushes upon him. He is lost and stupefied, and has neither thoughts to turn to, nor power to call upon, the Almighty Being, from whom alone he can seek mercy and forgiveness, and before whom his repentance can alone avail. Hours have glided by, and still he sits upon the same stone bench, with folded arms, heedless alike of the fast decreasing time before him, and the urgent entreaties of the good man at his side. The feeble light is wasting gradually, and the death-like stillness of the street without, broken only by the rumbling of some passing vehicle, which echoes mournfully through the empty yard, warns him that the night is waning fast away. The deep bell of St. Paul's strikes one. He heard it. It has roused him. Seven hours left. He paces the narrow limits of his cell with rapid strides, cold drops of terror standing on his forehead, and every muscle of his frame quivering with agony. Seven hours. He suffers himself to be led to his seat, mechanically takes a Bible which is placed in his hand, and tries to read and listen. No, his thoughts will wander. The book is torn and soiled by use, and like the book he read his lessons in at school just forty years ago. He never bestowed a thought upon it, perhaps since he left it as a child, and yet the place, the time, the room, nay, the very boys he played with, crowd as vividly before him as if they were scenes of yesterday, and some forgotten phrase, some childish word, rings in his ears like the echo of one uttered but a minute since. The voice of the clergyman recalls him to himself. He is reading from the sacred book its solemn promise of pardon for repentance, and its lawful denunciation of obdurate men. He falls upon his knees and clasps his hands to pray. Hush! That sound is what? He starts upon his feet. It cannot be too yet. Hark! Two quarters have struck. The third. The fourth. It is. Six hours left. Tell him not of repentance. Six hours repentance for eight times six years of guilt and sin. He buries his face in his hands and throws himself on the bench. Worn with watching and excitement, he sleeps. The same unsettled state of mind pursues him in his dreams. An insupportable load is taken from his breast. He is walking with his wife in a pleasant field, with the bright sky above them, and the fresh, boundless prospect on either side. How different from the stone walls of Newgate! She is looking, not as she did when he saw her for the last time in that dreadful place, but as she used when he loved her.
long, long ago, before misery and ill-treatment had altered her looks, and vice had changed his nature, and she is leaning upon his arm and looking up into his face with tenderness and affection, and he does not strike her now, nor rudely shake her from him. And oh, how glad he is to tell her all he had forgotten in that last hurried interview, and to fall upon his knees before her, and fervently beseech her pardon for all the unkindness and cruelty that wasted her form and broke her heart. The scene suddenly changes. He is on trial again. There are the judge and jury and prosecutors and witnesses, just as they were before. How full the court is! What a sea of heads! with a gallows, too, and a scaffold, and now all those people stare at him. Verdict. Guilty. No matter, he will escape. The night is dark and cold. The gates have been left open, and in an instant he is in the street, flying from the scene of his imprisonment like the wind. The streets are cleared, the open fields are gained, and the broad, wide country lies before him. Onward he dashes in the midst of darkness over hedge and ditch, through mud and pool, bounding from spot to spot, with a speed and lightness astonishing even to himself. At length he pauses. He must be safe from pursuit now. He will stretch himself on that bank and sleep till sunrise. A period of unconsciousness succeeds. He wakes, cold and wretched. The dull gray light of morning is stealing into his cell, and falls upon the form of the attendant turnkey. Confused by his dreams, he starts from the uneasy bed in a momentary uncertainty. It is but momentary. Every object in the narrow cell is too frightfully real to admit of doubt or mistake. He is the condemned felon again, guilty and despairing, and in two hours more will be dead. End of A Visit to Newgate